It is now my pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker. A postgraduate of the Qaid Azam University, Islamabad, Pakistan, and School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, Mr. Faisal Nayaz Tirbizi joined the Foreign Service of Pakistan in 1993. He has handled bilateral, multilateral, consular, and administrative assignments, both in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and abroad. He served in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as desk officer of Middle East, Central Asia, Afghanistan, India, as well as Director of Personnel, Protocol, and Foreign Secretary's Office. He has held various diplomatic assignments in Pakistan missions abroad in Ashgabat, Turkmenistan from 1996 to 1999, Permanent Mission of Pakistan to the, to the United Nations, Geneva, Switzerland from 2003 to, to, to 2007, and Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates from 2007 to 2010. Presently, he is serving as the Consul General of Pakistan in Chicago since September 2013. He is married with two children, Hashim and Nosherma. He is interested in traveling, reading, and trekking. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to present to you Consul General of Pakistan, Honorable Faisal Nyaz Tirmizi. First of all, a very good afternoon to all of you. It is indeed a singular honor and privilege to get an opportunity to speak at the US Air Force Academy. I get satisfaction from the fact that I'm not, a I'm not a aviator myself, but my father was an aviator, and he got his training from Fort Truckers, uh, Fort, uh, Fort Truckers Alabama in 1957. So when I was invited to speak on a subject at an Air Force Academy, I said, well, I do something which is completely opposite to what the Air Force or the military does. But I said, I would come and share my experiences over the last 23 years and talk to you, share some anecdotal, what the challenges of my job and share some of the anecdotal incidents that I've gone through. It is generally said the diplomat is a person who thinks twice before saying nothing. <laughs> I would be rather candid with you. Uh, I have had the privilege of uh, working in a bilateral, multilateral, protocol in three, four continents. And I thought my country is, has been in the eye of the storm for quite some time. Let's, I will be talking about that as well. I've dealt with some troubled spot, which is important for you, for Pakistan. And I'll be sharing those experiences as well. Just to start with, this is the second highest peak in the world. It's called K2. It is almost 8,611 meters, 28,251 feet. And this is Pakistan's border with China in the Northeast. And right next to this peak, we have been engaged in a pretty long protracted conflict with India, where the soldiers of two armies have been fighting a war since 1984, ranging from a height of 18,000 to 23,000 feet. So, but this is by itself, it is perhaps the most majestic mountain. People say it is hard to climb and it stands alone. And even yesterday when I was traveling on a small hop ride from um, from Denver to, to Colorado Spring, I was sitting right next to a lieutenant colonel of the US Air Force. And he had operated in these areas in the northern Pakistan. And he said that, that he could never believe the kind of mountains that he can see. Please. Well, that's what brought me here. 
as I say, it's an honor because I believe that the aviators are the aristocrats of the warrior class. And same through in Pakistan. The Pakistan Air Force is considered to be the premier organization in Pakistan. And I'm happy to note that the US Air Force has played historically a very important part in building that Air Force. I was sharing that my, one of my cousin, he got his trainings in T-33s, he flew F-86s, and of course, he never got onto the uh, F-16s, but that's a view of the Pakistani Air Force, one of the earlier flights. Yes, you'll be interested. What started my romance as a diplomat, or, or my diplomacy? It was a novel written by an American author. He wrote that novel way back in 1963. It's a story of an American second secretary posted in Kabul in 1946, right after World War II. And I've read that book a couple of times. If you ever get a chance, do read it. It's a fascinating account. So this is what started. I said, OK, so that's a nice field. So let's, I want to be a diplomat. I want to travel the world. I want to experience different cultures. And then I was very fortunate that as a high school student, I got an opportunity to go and live with the Canadian family in Nova Scotia. And that changed my perspective. And I was talking to all the young cadets yesterday and today for lunch. And I said two things. One thing that I suggest to all young people they should travel a lot, and they should read a lot. So that's something which opens your heart, it opens your mind, and that's something very important because these cadets are already in leadership rules, and they will be assuming higher roles of leadership in years to come. So it's something very important that they should have developed a sense of history, a sense of geography, and a sense of cultural understanding. That is something very important. And I think I've been very fortunate in that respect that I have lived, studied, worked abroad over the years and interacted with different cultures. So I'll be speaking. Thanks, please. Well, this is the first line of defense, as they say. Our job, your job starts when we fail. And if you fail or if you succeed, then our job starts again. Because we are the first line of defense. We are the, the foreign services, the State Department here in Pakistan, in India, all across the world. They are the f first line of defense which interact with foreign governments. Now they interact with the civil society with the media, with think tanks. We have the hands on the pulse of the people. That's something very important. Although I was talking to someone that every profession in the world, you will find a movie on. Of course, the aviators have Top Gun. The spies have their movie. Our job is something that it's not, very, it's not uh, in the limelight. But we do a lot of back-channel work, and we do a lot of things to smoothen things between the government, between the people, and at personal level. This is a debate, I'm sure. It's a ranging debate in the US between the Department of Defense and the State Department. It's the same in Pakistan, I can assure you. I've spoken to my colleagues in India. It's the same. But they are two different kinds of jobs. That, that's, that's what they say, that in the US State Department, there are around 5,000 diplomats. That's less than the people uh, that you have on one aircraft carrier. But they do a very important job, because they are manning around 240, 50 diplomatic missions all over the world. 
some of the posts are very cushion for instance i'm very fortunate that i'm in chicago but they are challenging posts and of course the state department people are also so that's a debate that i have had with my colleagues from the army from the military from the intelligence and of course we debate that you get more resources we get less resources but that's an ongoing debate but it's a, it's a very interesting debate but the nature of job of diplomats is quite different from yours yours or of intelligence agencies yes please well the next slide this is the f f f16 is being used by by the pakistan air force because we got these aircraft way back in 84 and this are still the mainstay of the pakistani air force for over the years and that's a great linkage because as i was telling to talking to my colleague this morning uh, mr yeager he he helped us to set up the pakistani air force and the linkages between the two air forces has been very strong next please now pakistan became the first muslim air force in which we have combat aircraft pilots so it's a rare occasion in a country which is considered to be a very conservative we have that's we have issues but it's a great honor and our women fighter pilots are flying combat missions in pakistan for the last 3 4 years and they've done a great job recently we lost one pilot in an air crash that was the first casualty but i guess in this profession that that's what's part of the game please yes today america is what rome was uh, 2000 years ago america is the preeminent political military education development power of the world you already know that the defense budget of us is more than the defense budget of eight countries combined together so that's a but the great thing about the americans is right now is that you create knowledge which very few society do and secondly you get your entrepreneurship uh your military power it has been a source of strength and secondly historically you have a great ability to attract the best and the brightest from all over the world but these things if you read history that's what i tell everyone there's one thing in history keeps people uh, people uh, to the countries keep on changing no country has ever remained at the top if you look when the britishers came to india in the 15th century it was time of jahangir who was the father of uh, of shah jahan the person who built the taj mahal at that time india's gnp was almost 30 40% what the mughal india was then in the 14th 15th century america is today the mongols won the 12th century so this is a cycle it keeps on changing but it it is a but being the most important power entails a lot of responsibility as well you have to use the stick of course if you had to have it you have to use it but there has to be a carrot and there has to be a cultural sensitivity and as i said i'll be talking during the course of my talks that even power no matter how unlimited power is it has its limits so so that's something i, I whenever that i talk to my colleagues from the american state department which have been very great friends over the last 23 years and i have been known for my candid views and i say that americans need to develop better cultural understanding of the different countries because being the preeminent power you are operating you will be operating in different parts of the world so it's very important that not only you should understand what is the power matrix there but what is really the cultural sensitivities and how to deal with different cultures with different people because historically those who people who have lived there over the centuries they have 
a better understanding of most of those issues. Next, please. This is the, my, the bread and butter, what I do in Chicago, the counselor work. <laughs> yeah. This is what gets me my, my paycheck. But you know, it's a very routine work, but at times it can be very satisfying. And I'll be sharing your experiences with you because we issue, certi we issue a lot of visas, uh, we issue passports, we attest documents. Now we've also started educating divorce cases, which we never used to do before. So uh, we visit jails, so it's, 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 it's something that we do and it's the, it's, it's the backbone. But of course, I, I only supervise this work, but most of my other colleagues are doing that, but it is the bread of butter of, of any foreign service all across the world. And you know, when you join the foreign service, that's the first thing they, they, they tell you. Like I know, I'm sure if you, my, once my father was in the army, he said when you join uh, a new regiment as a young second lieutenant, lieutenant, you have to spend six months with the troops in order to understand it. So when we join the service, they make sure that you get a counselor appointment and they make you sit on the window. Because then it teaches you a lot of confidence. It teaches you how to get interact with people and deal with them. Next, please. Trade is becoming increasingly important all over the world. And of course, we are laying a lot of emphasis on trade. US is, as president, the biggest trading partner of Pakistan, bilateral trading partner of Pakistan, the biggest source of exports. And we really cherish that relationship because that's something very important for a country like the trade, bilateral trade between Pakistan and, and US is only $7 billion. But that is something very big for us. And there is a lot of focus. We have a trade mission and we attend a lot of uh, trade uh, exhibitions and we have a lot of trade related activities. Next, please. This is connections and bridges. That's the most important part. As I say, we act as bridge between two different governments. Now, increasingly, we also act as connection and bridges between individuals. It's a connection. This is the first time I, I presume that you have heard a foreign service guy that too from Pakistan. And you know, these small connections in life are very important. I've learned over the experiences, the people that I went, I did my uh, training in the academy because we used to do a lot of training with the African diplomats. I met them during my postings in different places. The people I went to school with, you meet them there. And these connections are very important. And that's a very important part of my job that I give talks because I think it's a great opportunity because it's a two-way traffic. I'm learning from you. In fact, I spent some delightful two days with the young cadets here and I learned so many new things from them. But we make that connection. And of course, some down, probably you will never meet those people, but I've seen 20 years, 30 down, years down the road, those connections, those linkages that really matter, and you, you find the importance of those things, please. You know, this is a, as, you know, this is the normal stuff, but this is a young boy. His name is Shahzeb Bajwa. He came on a, on a State Department scholarship to University of Duluth in Minnesota in 2013. And I had hardly landed in the US for two weeks. And at night, I received a call from the State Department. They said this young boy has met an accident and he is in a coma. Can you do something? It was in the middle of another night, and we, I, 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 credit goes to the State Department, we worked really closely, and in four days' time, his family was here. This young boy is unfortunately still in coma for the last two years, but that's one of the rare examples where I thought the two foreign services, they, we worked wonderfully well. We were on phone because we wanted this child 
that he should be given the best medical attention and he should be looked after. And so I think that that's, I, I, I get a lot of satisfaction from these small things. If you, if you help someone, and this news was picked up by Washington Post, by the CNN, BBC, and that's what I told my American. I said, you know, you've spent a lot of money for publicity. I think that's a great way because these are the human connections. And, and I think that that's one of the things uh, that has, uh, I, I, I cherish from my posting, please, next one. Yes. Apparently, as I was saying, like you, the American State Department, the Pakistani State Department, we also work on the front lines. The Americans, Pakistanis, we have lost ambassadors, we have lost diplomats all across the world. But that's what our job is. We try our best, because that's what our job is. We try our best to avoid these conflicts. But of course, that's how world politics is. We try to contain them, and we try to make the best out of it. So these are the difficult posts, of course, because once I joined, that's what people said, oh, the State Department, the Foreign Service, you'll have a great life, high whining and dining. But it, it entails a lot of hard work, I can assure you. And over the years, it has become more challenging, but it has become more rewarding as well. Next, please. Yeah, politics, that, this is our main thing. That's what we do. We engage in negotiations. We are the first line of contact between the two governments. We negotiated international treaties. I was posted in Geneva on, on behalf of Pakistan. I negotiated international convention on enforced disappearance. Uh, I have, uh, we arranged high level visits. We make things work. I work with the protocol of the president, visited with him in different countries. So the, and, and we deal with some real hard negotiations because you know I have been fortunate in that respect that I have been on a hot seat during different occasions. When 9-11 happened, I was director of Afghanistan. In 2002, when India and Pakistan were eyeball to eyeball, and we thought that any moment these two nuclear powered countries may break out into a war, I was de dealing with that issue. Then I had a great opportunity between 2012 to 13 to be the chief of staff of the foreign secretary who was the head of diplomatic war. And we engaged in some of the, the, the events that affected us. In fact, when the two, uh, Osama bin Laden thing happened, when uh, Salal X incident happened, I was there. So I've had the honor of witnessing things uh, at close range and there have been difficult times but they have been very rewarding and challenging as well. Next, please. Now, if you remember this horse, this is the horse with what, which was with the cottage of funeral of President Kennedy, if you remember this. This was a gift from the government of Pakistan. It was, it, it, its name was Sardar, and this was the horse. And uh, uh, so we've had some amazing relationship over the years. And I say that we've had ups and downs. It's not the best of relationship. I, I don't make my bones about it. But it has a relationship which has, the US has played an, an important role in building the defense capabilities of Pakistan, in bringing in the food revolution in the 60s, in, in training our initial technical staff, great role. But as I always say, two significant achievements of the US foreign policy post-World War II, you may disagree with them. Defeat of Soviet Union and opening to China was only made possible with Pakistan. In fact, when President Kissinger landed in Beijing in 72, the first words uttered to him by Chu Premier Chu and Lai was never forget the bridges we cross. So it's an important relationship. And I was just 
going through the historical, uh, next please. This was the first Prime Minister of Pakistan, Liaquat Ali Khan. He came to the US in 1950. That was a historical visit. And uh, then of course, this is uh, Mrs. Kennedy traveling on PIA to London. So, and as I was reading a book, I, I wasn't aware of that, that only once in the US history, a foreign dignitary has been given an official banquet in the residence of uh, President George Washington, and that honor was given to Pakistan in the 60s. So it has been, a, we've gone through rough paces, pay, pay, uh, paces, but we've had a sturdy relationship over the years. Next, please. Next. Uh, language. Yes, that's an important skill that we have to do because we are, we are uh, operating in different countries, so we have to learn different languages. And we have to have, we get a lot of understanding on their cultural norms, on the social norms. And I'm sure now these armed forces have also become, you have a foreign, so you have to learn these language skills. That's something that you would be needing because as I said, you are the preeminent power. You are the modern day Rome. So in fact, as I was traveling, I was reading that the one million foreign students come to the US every year and around only 300,000 Americans study abroad. I would strongly urge, especially the young cadets, if they ever get an opportunity, they should go and expose themselves to foreign training institutes and go to challenging places. Don't go necessarily to the best places, go to a challenging places. And believe me, you will have to push yourself a bit more, but you, it will, you'll learn a lot more. Next, please. Yeah, you have to be a social skill. I, I was myself, I was an introvert before I joined the foreign service. And thanks to this job, I had to change myself completely. Because since I have to engage with people, I have to meet them. In fact, the first time I went to the UN, I had done a, a, a bit of public speaking, but the first time I went to the UN, and I was sitting right next to my ambassador, and there were delegations from 192 countries sitting right next to me. And the ambassador said, no, you have to take the floor. I was shaking like this. <laughs> but over the years, thanks to the service, the exposure, I have changed myself, learned new skills, made some tremendous, excellent friends. Some of my closest friends are from the US State Department, with whom I have served in difficult places. And though that, that friendship and that social skills has helped me a lot. Yes, please, next. High life or a meaningful life? As I said, it's a meaningful life. Because of course you are in, involved in high politics, you are involved in some very sensitive negotiation and some very sensitive dis discussions. But of course, what really touches you? If you help someone genuinely, and what, that's a, it is in that respect, it's a very rewarding and a meaningful life for me. And I'm, I consider myself to be very fortunate that coming from not a very affluent country as US, it has given me a great experience to interact with the best from the world and to help people from my country or from the other countries on small issues. And that's something very important because that's something very important in life. I've, I've listened to some amazing talks today and you have to have a legacy. You have to leave something behind you. So in that respect, I'm very fortunate. Yes, as I was talking about, Pakistan is a very new country. We only got independence in <clears throat> 1947. But we are an old civilization. In fact, I have a standing joke with all my Indian counterparts where I, wherever I go. I say, Pakistan should have been named India because India is named India after the river Indus. Indus flows through Pakistan. <laughs> so that's the river. And the, the, the origins of the Hindu religion was not the Ganges plain. 
It was on the banks of River Indus. Historically, the Gandhara civilization, which brought Buddhism to Japan, China, Far East, it started from Pakistan. Texala was the preeminent center of the Buddhist civilization and culture in Pakistan. And not historical reference once more. Alexander is the, Pakistan is the place where Alexander had decided that they don't want to go any further. He lost his horse, Bisophilus, on the banks of River Jhelum, which runs 70 miles south of my hometown. Alexander himself got mortally wounded in battle in Multan, which is right in the center of Pakistan. And because of those wounds, Alexander the Great finally succumbed to them in Babylon. So historically, it, is, it has been the frontier region. We are at the frontier region. We have witnessed historical conflicts. But it, it's, it's a new country, but an old civilization. The Mughals came from there. The Britishers came from there. In fact, yesterday I met one of the speaker, Colonel McGregor. He's speaking here, US Army as well. He told me that his grandfather had served with the British Army in what is Pakistan. And historically, if you read the history, the area which comprises now modern day Pakistan, only the Scots, mostly the Scots, and the Irish from the British Army used to serve there. That's something, an interesting fact. And now the commander of the US forces, General Nicholson, his great grand great uncle has a big monument in Texela, which is 20 miles outside. General Nicholson was the commander of the British forces, which we call the War of Independence of 1857, but the British called the Great Rebellion. So he, <laughs> so he, fought, he led the British Army, and he died on the gates of, of Delhi. But his monument, even after all those years, still stands in Texala, and his great grand uncle, uh, nephew is now serving in the US forces in Afghanistan. History takes some, some really fascinating turn. Well, one small example. If you look at Afghanistan, uh, uh, there was, there's a fascinating book, if you all get some time, it's called The Return of a King. Uh, it's written by William Dalrymple, and it's about the, the tale of the first Afghan army, which went to Afghanistan in 1839 to 1842. And when the Afghan army was traveling through Balochistan, one of the, the tribal leaders, Mir Mehrab Khan, he came to see the British general. He said, General, well, you're taking an army to Afghanistan, but how do you propose to take it out? So it's a, it's a, it's a very turbulent area. It is in, in the eye of turbulence. And frankly, uh, where I thought, when the Soviet Union ended, we thought that we are entering into an era where all will be hunky-dory, and all will be well. But the world has entered into a new phase of uh, conflict. But I hope, I strongly believe, of course, war will always be an instrument which states will use. Well, that's a human nature. But it entails a lot of misery as well. So I hope we live in a much better world with this low, less conflict and more development. In fact, just before 9-11, we had detailed discussions with the Americans. And we told them categorically, we said, you, us, Saudis, the Soviets, have made a mess of things in Afghanistan. For a change, let's invest in peace. If we build roads, we build schools. We bring pipelines from Central Asia to India. It will have a knock-on dividend effect on Afghanistan because those people have suffered a lot. And unfortunately, we didn't do it. And I tell it openly to my colleagues in the military, in the intelligence service, that Afghanistan has been the graveyard of, of, of empire, and Pakistan is not an empire. We, although we're the sixth populous country, but we are nowhere close to the big military powers. What we need is more development. That's, I, I, I've been a strong proponent of that. Next, please. Well, these are the colorful, some of the 
tourism potential in Pakistan. Unfortunately, when I was growing up in the 70s, Pakistan, my hometown, was on the hippie trail. So we used to get a lot of hippies from North America, from Europe. We used to travel all the way from Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, all the way to... But after 79, frankly, we have stopped getting any Western tourists. The only people who come to Pakistan generally are either working for development agencies on, or, or in uh, NGOs, not governmental organizations. And I tell everyone that we need more CEOs than NGOs. And we want to go back to normal times that as a young bo boy in school, I've seen in my country, and I've seen it transform the whole region. Next, please. Challenges. Next, please. Well, it's a, it's a different world. As I said, we believed that that was the end of history, that once the Soviet Union, Soviets were defeated, I was in a university which was right next to the Soviet embassy. And I've seen it from my eyes, the, the, the sickle, uh, the red flag of Soviet Union coming down and the tricolor coming up. But unfortunately, it has become a more complex and a more difficult world. And it's a, it's, but the globalization has its positive points as well, especially for developing countries like Pakistan, India, because it's a flatter world. People don't have to travel there. People are getting new ideas, and it, has, it, it is becoming new opportunities. Terrorism. Terrorism is something, frankly, I vividly remember 9-11. I was sitting in my office when it happened. And it has had repercussions even today. But we have, through numerous, we've lost around 70, 80,000 people since 9-11. And it's a global concern. And frankly, if you ask me, What's happening in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, Yemen? I am concerned because that order was created after World War I. And I still remember I was in Geneva when that article was published in the Air Force General. And I talked to my colleague the, in, in, the, in the State Department who was with me in Geneva. I said, now this is something, if you start changing the boundaries, it will affect the life of common people. And it will have far, far, far reaching effect. But this is one issue that we have to deal with. You have to use tech, but there has to be a more innovative strategies that how you have to wean young people from my part of the world or people from my faith to go in that direction. You have to bring them back. Because believe me, it was said today in by one of the lectures that I say, People all over the world, they're the same. Irrespective of the color of the skin, their faith, they all want food on the table. They want jobs. They want a normal life. So that's something that, uh, uh, and these fringe elements, they are fringe elements in all societies. You have to deal with them. You have to use, stick with them as well. My own nephew, he spent two years in hospital. He's a young second lieutenant. He was fighting the Taliban. He, he got 33 fractures from here to here. We are using that. But force is not the only thing. Somehow, somehow or the other, we have to give, come up with a stronger idea, with a stronger purpose to wean those young people away from extremism, which is ravaging the whole. Migration and refugees, even today, Pakistan has been hosting the biggest refugees, number of refugees in the world. I talked to my Turkish colleague, I talked to my German colleague, I talked to, there are four or five million Afghans still living in Pakistan. And believe me, as I said, Pakistan is not a very affluent country. And this instability is creating more disturbances, which is a crisis that we are all dealing with. Uh, Transnational crime, of course, it has again increased many fold. The, uh, all countries are working together. Environment. Pakistan is one of the few countries which has the least carbon footprint, but we have seen the impact myself. Generally, we used to have one big flood every 10 years. 
For the last six, seven years, we have had five floods. So that is something mind boggling. I was talking to my colleague from Bangladesh. He said the coastal areas of Bangladesh are facing a massive problem. I've been to Maldives. If the, uh, the water of level increases by one more feet, that country will completely disappear. And it's such a beautiful country. I'm happy this is the 2015 has been the first year that we have reduced the carbon footprint. And I hope, but this is the issues that we are dealing with in all levels. And of course, public diplomacy. We are dealing with public, we are dealing with the media, and this is a new form of diplomacy, because before diplomacy, when I joined, that was the classical form of diplomacy. I was told by my ambassador that you never conduct diplomacy through media. Everything which is decided in the room should stay in the room. But now, the, through technology, things are becoming more savvy. So we are also getting, running new technology, and, and we share with, with the media, with civil society. Next. Yeah. Frequent movings, yes, that's a challenge. After three years, my eldest son, who's 20, he has been to school in six different countries, three, six different curriculas, six different environments, six different languages. My youngest son, who's 15, he's been to school in four different countries. They hate me for that, but I tell them that later they will really appreciate the kind of exposure that they have got in living in so many different countries, living, speaking so many different languages, because these are the third generation. They are, the, these kids belong to the world. But it, it, it is a very, dis, it, it's, a, it's a challenging circumstance. As a, as a military kid, my father used to move after, after, after three years. But that was within the country. But my life, our life is moving three years from one continent to the other. So, but it has, I, I enjoy it even today. Uh, education, I said, uh, they are, uh, I've already spoken about the danger spots. Uh, it's a 24-hour job, and it's a labor of love. That's what I tell everyone. I said that if you don't love your profession, don't do it. Because if you have to do it for the rest of your life, or 10 years of life, it has to be a labor of love. So this is what I would like wanted to share with you, and if you have any questions, I would be very happy to take it. So, um, regarding COVID, you, you, you talked to uh, America needs to be better at, at, at cultural sensitivity and cultural awareness and, and, and those kinds of skills. Um, rate, rate us. How, how bad or how good are we? And I, I ask that question because uh, I'm a Peace Corps volunteer from the 70s, and back then we read uh, The Ugly American, which was a book from the 50s, right? And that, and that book back then said, uh, was basically saying America is losing its, the United States is losing its influence throughout the world because we don't speak the languages, or we don't understand these other people throughout the world. Are, are, are we, tell, compare, can, can you compare us to other countries? Or, are we really that bad? Are we better than other countries? So what are we doing? Let me share you an example. Mrs. Kennedy traveled to Pakistan in March 61 or 62. I'm not. And when she went to Pakistan, she was received with huge crowds of thousands of people, and she traveled in an open car. Her last port of call was the Khyber Agency which is now on the tribal areas of Pakistan. And the Pathans were delighted to meet her. And it was, but over the years, yes, I have noticed this thing that my understanding is, I'm, I'm not an expert, but my understanding is that the US policies are basically for four years or maximum eight years. There has to be more continuity because there have to be some people who should be able to plan long terms. That, frankly, because American food, American culture, American music, American movies are still the most important. I got used to, because a lot of people ask me, from where did you learn the language? 
I had never traveled before. Of course, I spent as a high school, but it was American culture. We, we, I grew up on American movies, uh, the same food. But over the years, I've seen in my part of the world where there was a strong bonding towards America. Pakistan was very grateful for the, for the revolution that was brought in. In terms of money, if you ask me, the Americans have spent much more, given much more to Pakistan than the Chinese. But there's nothing to show for. What the Chinese built is something that we see. They built the roads. American built the dams in the 60s and 70s, but built something which stays there for, and the people can see it. Uh, the last U.S. ambassador, Olson, he was, uh, when he was the U.S. ambassador to Abu Dhabi, I was the number two in Abu Dhabi. And he asked me, Faisal, that what's the reason? I said, ambassador, instead of giving this money to projects which really don't matter, I said, build one world-class university or one world-class hospital with the American name. That would go a long way. Rather than, frankly, if you ask me, there's a, there's a, there's a, a lot of this money is spent on the beltway. It goes to the consultants. It hardly trickles down to the people. Bring something that the people can feel it. I think the Americans, that's something I can suggest offhand. But, but we, can, we can build those things without speaking different languages. And, 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 and yes, eating you the can. food of the locals, right? Are the Chinese better at it than us? Are they, yeah, are, they are better. Are they better exactly. at, you know, they, 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 are they, the Russians, the Europeans, do they speak the languages better than, than the Americans? Are, do we have a bad reputation in that sense still? It's hard to say, but now there are a lot of Chinese in Pakistan. And I meet them, and quite a few of them do speak our language. And it breaks a lot of barriers. But I guess since you are the preeminent power, and the world speaks English. But, uh, but cultural understanding, my understanding is that the British, the French, who are the old traditional colonial powers, they developed a more cultural understanding of the people than the Americans. That's my take. You may disagree with me. No, no, I'm asking. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, we, we heard the opening talk this morning about trust. In, and I, I, yes, I was trust is the, is the, uh, the lubricant of leadership, and I would presume that trust is also the lubricant of diplomacy. But diplomats are often uh, caught between a rock and a hard place because they try to build individual relationships. They have to represent their country. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how, you've, uh, how you've found it best to establish trust in the different diplomatic positions that you held? You know, that's the traditional, there was a saying that diplomat is a person who's sent abroad to lie for the good of his country. <laughs> but I always disagreed with it. Because trust is your currency. And of course, I agree with you. There are, people, there are things that you have a personal relationship, but you have a different mandate. And ultimately, that's how all the governments all over the world work. We speak what we are mandated to speak. We have our likings, we have our dislikings. That we can question within the internal meetings that we have, interagency or within the agency. But once we have given a thing that we have to, and it's a, it, it, at times it, 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 it can get very complicated. Because for instance, I'll be very blunt with you. I was dealing with human rights at the UN in Geneva. There are certain serious issues with my country in terms of human rights. I internally, I disagreed, disagreed with them, but I had to say what I was mandated to say. So this is the, the, the job, hazards of the job that you have to deal with. Yes, please. Sir, do you think the US Pakistan relations have been kind of shaky as a result of finding the most notorious terrorist on earth in Pakistan next to a military base? Is that, you know, is there, is there an argument here that the US must be skeptical of that relationship? Trust, to speak of trust, given the fact that Bin Laden was found right there next to a military base? You know, if you read the whole, I've, I've read the report. We had a big inquiry. In fact, I was the chief of staff of the foreign secretary when the whole incident happened. And believe me, at that time, the US-Pakistan relationship was at the lowest point that I have witnessed in 2011. Because first, 
a few weeks before, we had that incident in which uh, uh, Raymond Davis was involved. Then OBL happened. A few weeks after that, the Salala incident when 26 Pakistani soldiers were killed. Osama bin Laden was a creation of Pakistan, American, and the Saudis. We created that monster, and I accept it. But if you read the accounts, the lead to Osama bin Laden was given by the US, by the Pakistani intelligence agency to the US, CIA. On the basis of that lead, they got hold of him. And after that, they took out all the documents, all the computers from his compound. Had there been any shred of evidence of the state, it, have, would have, it, it would have been, uh, it would have really been out by now. The question I, I return, I, because this, I've been asked these questions at different forums, and I tell you, the 19 hijackers, they were here in the US for a long time. The CIA couldn't detect us. So it was an I believe, I sincerely believe. I don't know what the real, it was a real intelligence failure. Is it, is it documented anywhere that the Pakistani intelligence gave tip to the US government? Yes, it is. Has it been documented? Yes, it is. It's, it's, it's in, the, in, in the US media, in Washington Post, New York Times. The, the tip of the carrier was given by the Pakistani intelligence agency to CIA. On the basis of that, they reached him. Was he working for the Pakistani government or an informant for the US? It was, uh, it was basically a technical intelligence. They have picked up his conversation, and that was shared by the US. And you know, if you remember the first statement of President Obama, the first statement, he thanked Pakistan. Sir. Uh, it, it's quoted a lot that there has to be a political solution in Afghanistan. Um, but. The Taliban don't seem to want to talk. Um, there have been several instances where there was going to be talks and then they haven't happened. What do you think is going to have to happen before the Taliban are willing to talk? You know, we had arranged the first contact between the Taliban and the Afghan government. Uh, just a few days of before when it was announced by the Afghan intelligence that Mullah Omar was dead. And I think it was a great disservice to Afghanistan, to the Americans, to the Chinese, to Pakistan. Because that was the real first formal contact between the Taliban and the Afghan government. So you know, now the Afghans think that they are winning the war. So why should they negotiate? This is what they think. And you know, I, 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 I encourage a lot of you. There's a, there's a professor, Dr. Wali Nasser. He's a professor at, at Georgetown. Not Georgetown, at Johns Hopkins. He has written a book, The Dispensable Nation. Read that book. It's called The Dispensable Nation. It's on the US foreign policy. And um, it's a, it's a very intractable problem, because I was dealing with Taliban. I've met them. I've not met Mullah Omar, but I've met a lot of, because I was dealing with them, because Pakistan was one of the three countries which had recognized them. But I always believe that what they signified, it can only be defeated, because those people had seen nothing but war during the last 30 years. We had trained them. It was, I accept that. Pakistan was involved in that. You have to wean them away from that. And the only way to do it is to build roads, school, bring some semblance of normal life in that country. And we believe, I was, we were working on those pipelines with Unicol from Central Asia to India. Had those pipelines been built there and then, it would have had a tremendous social knock-on effect on Afghanistan, on Pakistan, on India, it would have integrated the whole region together economically. And it's one thing, I, I strongly believe that the world, Pakistan included, 
we have to do a lot for that country because they they defeated the Soviets. Believe me, no one has. They they broke the the uh, the Berlin Wall, and they had to be. I don't know, but this is something we have to work together to bring more development to that country and more stability to that country. But that process, we are again trying to restart that process. I hope we succeed. But frankly, what I read, that's what the Taliban said. We are going to win anyways because the Americans will leave and we'll get it. It's a when I was a young officer, I was an instructor in a pilot training. In those years, we, we trained Pakistani student pilots. I had a Pakistani student who was a very good pilot. Where do the Pakistani pilots train now? So we train ourselves now. It's, it's a, it, that's as, as I was saying, that probably the first sh we shot mm -hmm. down some seven, eight Soviet MiGs during the Afghan war. Pakistani pilots are considered to be one of the best. And that's, the, that's what I was saying. The linkages between Pakistan Air Force and, U and US Air Force have been very strong. Uh, in fact, I was talking to, there was an exercise conducted in Abu Dhabi when I was posted there. And I was talking to the, to the CEO, the commanding squadron officer of the US Air Force. And the U UE Air Force, Pakistani Air Force, uh, American Air Force, and the British Air Force were, were training together. And he had nothing but praise on the skills of the Pakistani. But he said, where we lack, we don't have the beyond vision range missiles. But in terms of the traditional dogfight in our skills, they are considered uh, to be the top notch. They are pretty good. And we are, Pakistan is thankful. That's the linkage that we've had. I told you, my father got his training, helicopter training from four truckers in 57 from, from, from the US. And you know what happened? These kind of relationship, and right after when the Soviets left, Americans put all the sanctions on us. There was no interaction. <coughs> that was, I think, so a great mistake. Because these connections should continue. Because you should know. Because between 1989 and 2001, there was hardly any government to government level interaction between the US and Pakistan. This relationship, Pakistan, is not a very big country, but it's still the sixth biggest country in the world in terms of population. We are median age is 26 years old. It's a young population. We are at the crossroads of Middle East on our west, South Asia on our east India, China on our, on our north. So we are at the crossroad. It will always remain an important country for the US and for the world. Sir. Sir, uh, American politics are very divisive. Uh, and uh, as an American, you get almost a little bit of whiplash as power swings from Democrat to Republican. There's a lot of rhetoric exchange uh, as that happens. And I'm wondering, how apparent is that change to the outside world? How much does that, in fact, affect how we actually interact with foreign powers? You know, we, all over, we look very closely at American politics. That's something very important for us and most countries of the world. So yeah, yeah. We, we, we watch it. That's what my, my, one of my primary job is, to watch and send the trends to my government, what is happening in politics. But, so we watch it very closely, but you know, it happens. Politics is like that. Sure, I'm sure it's like that. <laughs> yes? So as you said, traveling and reading is very important. Uh, what would be one book that everyone in this room has to read and one place to visit while they're alive? One book? It's very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> very difficult. Well, uh, I read a lot. That's a passion for me. I don't know. Um, I, uh, James Mishner, read it. I, I still find it relevant even today. It's a novel. And the one uh, other book that I mentioned, it, if you're interested in the, in the politics of that region, historical politics, it, it's called The Return of a King, which is on the first of one war. And you know exactly the things what the Britishers did in 1839-42, the Americans did the same thing. They imposed a ruler on Afghanistan, Shah Shuja, who was living in India. They sent him with the British army. 
and his great grandson was the same tribe, the same people. It's a tribal society, I accept it. I come from a region, we are still very tribal. We have not reached that level of, because you, America is, is a unique country in that respect. Because you, you, you've broken your links from the old world. We come from the ancient world, as I told you. So those links are pretty strong. I find that book personally, I've read it recently, I find it very fascinating account. Wali Nasser's books, The Dispensable Nation on the US Foreign Policy on Middle East. I found it to be a very readable book. But one, very difficult. My one book that I find is, is in my language. It, 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 it's a small essay on small things. But I wish if you could <laughs> read that, I can suggest that book to you. So. Sir, what is the most challenging diplomatic uh, moment you've had, and how did you work through it? You know, that's what I was saying, 2011. I was, I was the chief of staff, I was not dealing with it, I was dealing with the foreign secretary. That's what I thought, uh, that uh, it, the, it, we are entering. And the, the other, if you ask the second, the most troubling was 2002. Yes, if you ask me, that for me personally, I was director of India. We had already moved our troops to the border. We had expelled each other's high commissioners, which are the ambassadors of Commonwealth countries. We had then expelled each other's acting high commissioners as well. And I remember talking to my Indian colleague. I said, Ravi, I'm not, it was, I said, we are the last people speaking, talking to each other. Imagine what will happen if we stop talking. I was very tense because you were fortunate because between the Soviets and the Americans, there was still a lot of space. With India, we share the same border. <laughs> you take off from one country, you enter the other one. So that's a very important relationship of Pakistan and a very tricky. And I hope that over a period of time, we are able to resolve our differences with them because we share the same geography. I was talking to one of your colleagues that in terms of speaking, he said, how, goes your, how good is your Arabic? I started laughing. I said, I can read Arabic because we use the same alphabet. But if you, I speak the language which is closest to Hindi, I have absolutely no, they use different alphabets, but I can, and after that, them the Persian, I can, I have to make an effort. But Arabs make only 25% of the Islamic, and that's a very big misconception. Most of the Muslims are living in South Asia and Far East than in, in the Middle East. So, so if, if you ask me personally, that was the most challenging in 2002 with India when we came very close. And I was concerned, not for myself, for my children, that I hope we live in a world where there's less violence and more sanity. Sorry. Sorry. Um, we talked about the impact of politics on foreign relations. Um, how about um, changing administrations? How do changing administrations impact the Pakistan-India relationship? And uh, when was the best, during your lifetime, when was the most friendly period of India-Pakistan relations? I mean, I'm sorry. It's no, a no. Part question. Uh, what's the current trend line? Is it getting better or worse? You know, the, the best was, frankly, I confess it, was uh, when the two countries had conducted nuclear weapon tests and they, we had come out out of the closet that we have the capability. After that, Mr. Vajpayee, who was the Indian Prime Minister, he came to Pakistan. Um, I say it on my personal level, not on state level, it was a mistake on our part to climb the hills of Kargil at that stage, but it was a mistake. But now, once the new Prime Minister of India was elected, I thought, because I've always believed that the relationship between India and Pakistan will only improve if there's a right wing, BJP government in India, like only Nixon could have had an opening to China. No democratic president could have. You needed someone who had strong anti-communist, anti-China rhetoric, only he can negotiate with them. So when this government of Mr. Modi was elected, I was pretty hopeful. And when he invited the Prime Minister of Pakistan to his inauguration ceremony, swearing in ceremony in New Delhi, uh, foreign office supported it. Our intelligence and military was against that idea. But unfortunately, what we witnessed, 
when the Prime Minister of Pakistan was already in India, uh, they started coming out with some really obnoxious statements and remarks. So it has vitiated the environment. But the good thing is, I believe, that we cannot live in perpetual conflict with India. That is draining their potential. It is draining our potential. Sooner or later, we have to reach some understanding and live in a more civilized manner because that's the only way out. We share the same space. We've shared it forever. We've been living there. We share the spare space. So I, I believe, hopefully, not now, but probably in five, ten years' time, we should be able to reach some understanding with them. And there should be more people-to-people -people contact. There should be more trade between the two countries. Because you know that's what really connects people, ultimately, when you meet them more often. Because uh, I don't know, as I was saying when I was growing up, if you visit Pakistan, if you meet, you create a better understanding of the people. So unfortunately, although we share, we are right next to each other, there are hardly any tourist, tourism between the two countries. So that, for the starters, that should start. Any more? Sir. So regarding the, 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 the success and failure of, of diplomacy, um, how, how influential are the, are the personalities of the, of the diplomats, or the chemistry between the diplomats? Very important. Although we have to meet our, because if you don't f connect to someone, you cannot have a breakthrough. That's my personal experience. You have to have that chemistry. Uh, but of course, but ultimately at our level, we are not at the top. We have to follow the mandate which is given to us. But over the years, I've made some great friends. India is considered to be our adversary. But I have some great friends in the Indian Foreign Service over the years. I have negotiated with them. We have disagreed privately, publicly. But the friendship still continues. Because that, that's the beauty of human nature. That's what I was saying. The French and the Germans were killing each other 60 years ago. They overcame that thing. The Americans and the Vietnamese were fighting each other. Things are normal. So you have to wait for, for a moment when you start connecting with people and hope for the best, because that's something very important. You have to have hope. Despite all the challenges that my country and my region is passing through, we are still, we hope that someday we'll take that turn and we will start living a normal life, which is being lived. Because we are living in interesting times. And I want to live in an interesting time. My children should live. <laughs> that's my wish. We have time for about one more question. Any more questions? <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, you, you referred to the relationship between India and Pakistan. How about the relationship between Pakistan and the other neighbor, Iran? Uh, how do you characterize that relationship? You know, Iran was the first country we had very close relationship with Iran until Shah was there. The two countries, frankly, when we were fighting two wars with India in 65 and 71, Iranians and, uh, and Turks and Malaysians helped us a lot. After the revolution in Iran, it's a love-hate relationship. I'll be very, <laughs> because they believe, they consider us to be the lackeys of America and Saudi Arabia on the eastern border. Because Pakistani is predominantly a Sunni state, but they're 30 percent Shias. You know, after Iran, the most number of Shias are in Pakistan, and not not many people know about that. The founder of Pakistan was a Shia. Most of our Yahya Khan, <coughs> Sekandar Mirza, the last president Asif Ali Zardari, he was a Shia. So. In Pakistan, it's not an issue, frankly. We have had it, but it's not a big issue. But I strongly believe that Iran, Pakistan, India pipeline should be built as soon as possible, because it is economically very important for us. And it will start that connection with Iran. Iran is, again, an old civilization. It, has been, it was a superpower 3,000 years ago, before the Romans. And, and if you go there, that you realize if you look at the, read the history of Islam, 
The Arabs and the Turks had the muscle. They were the fighters. The refinement, the culture was the Iranian. The Mughals who ruled India were Turks. They used to speak Turkish at home, but the court language had always been Persian. So that's something Iranian-Pakistan relation is very important. I strongly believe that the most stability that you have derive is from your immediate neighborhood. If there is peace and stability there, there is peace in your country. Mr. Timothy, thank you for your message. I'm, I'm very confident that uh, all the audience, especially the cadets, would, uh, would, be, would be able to apply the knowledge and the understanding that you've given to them, especially about cultural sensitivity and understanding different, different cultures, because they're going to be leading other forces. Yeah. So it's, it's really important. And uh, once again, I would thank you.